You're watching Catalyst. Season 4, Episode 11. Stay tuned for more shows. episode of Artlist for the semester. Today we have a very special guest. I'm here with Nick. Say hello. Hi. Your fans. All right. Um, so Nick is actually one of the editors of Artlist and we decided to feature him today because he's awesome. So what kind of art do you do? Uh, I play clarinet. Clarinet. How long have you been doing that? Uh, probably about 10 years. 10 years. Wow. Yeah, ever since like fourth or fifth grade, something like that. And uh, what got you into it? Uh, cause we had to play an instrument in like starting in fourth grade, so I tried violin cause I thought that'd be cool, but my teacher was terrible, so I just kind of switched <laughs> to clarinet and I stuck with it ever since. So was your teacher for clarinet much better then? Much better, yeah. That's good. I mean, clarinet people are usually pretty mellow, pretty like, I, I don't want to say quiet, but they're like kind of the intelligent people <laughs> the band, <laughs> okay. I guess. I don't know, so they're easy to work with. So if I want to impress someone, should I just carry around a clarinet? Uh. Yeah, you could cool. try that. Cool, good advice. All right, um, so what kind of, um, does anything inspires you to play your music? Do you look up to anyone, have any role models or anything like that? I do like, I have to say, I like Pete Fountain. He's mm -hmm. a jazz clarinetist. I feel like jazz clarinet is pretty underrated and it's something that I'd like to get into more in the future. Yeah, I've never actually heard of jazz clarinet. It sounds pretty cool. It's very cool, yeah. It's... And then, do you ever play at Oxy? Is there any chance that anyone here could catch a glimpse of you doing your art? <laughs> I do. I play in the Caltech Oxy uh, concert band. We have a concert in February, I think, so you should check that out. Awesome. It's good stuff. So check that out, and in the meantime, we're going to check out his art. <laughs> on-screen personality? Well, apply now to Catalyst, Occidental's only television network on campus. We're accepting applications until January, so go now to the link for more information. On this week's episode, I'm going to show you how to fold a pretty elegant rose out of a marketplace. So the first thing you do is you take a napkin and you want to unfold it all the way and smooth it out a little bit. And you've got roughly a square. Next thing you want to do is take one edge and fold it up a 
tiny bit of the way, maybe a tenth of the way. An eighth, a tenth of the way. Turn it over. And you take a second corner, the second edge, and fold it up. About the same distance as the first one. So that you get kind of a square. And then you take this edge. this edge with the folded edge and that becomes your bud so you figure out how long you want it to be and then you squeeze and there's the bud and then you can start pinching and twisting to work on the stem now to make the leaf you take the corner you pull it up and then you separate out the rest of the stem. And then you do the same thing. Pinch. And then you keep twisting all the way to the board. It's coming loose here a little bit. You want to Have a nice break. Take a break and relieve your stress. Go get some furry friends provided by Therapy Dogs International. I'm Nina Carlin, this is Expressions, and today we're filming Greg Toth in his room and Anthony Porcelli in his room. Greg is a musician on campus and Anthony is a music blogger, so we'll see where they make their music and where they blog. My name is Greg Toth. I've been playing the guitar, uh, how long have I been playing that thing? It's like four years, three years, something like that. But I played piano beforehand, so it's not like I just picked this up and I'm like, woo! You know, I had some experience beforehand. Do you have any favorite artists that you listen to? <sighs> favorite artists that I listen to would be, you know, I listen to a lot of jazz. So there's a lot of there's a lot of jazz guys there. Um, not necessarily just guitar too. Like the jazz flute, now there's something, because you don't see many people playing the flute and stuff. I just like to hear those wind instruments and jazz, and like the guitar, you know, the piano is just like a more, a more, more faceted, multifaceted version of the guitar, because you got more things to ding dong on. That's when I played in the cooler one time. I didn't get quite the reception I was looking for. But oh well, you know. Everybody's going out, feeling alright. Except for me, I'm on my own tonight. Sitting all alone in the rectory cellar. What is your major? I think sociology. My major is. 
Um, and what grade are you in at Occidental? Um, freshman. Anthony, can you tell us a little bit about YesGoodMusic.com? Uh, yes, Good Music's a blog me and my friends made two, year, two or three years ago, just to like blog about music and like share new music with people. And it ended up getting pretty popular, and we talked to a lot of popular artists from it, which is pretty cool. What popular artists? Well, not that popular, but like Logic. If you know Logic, used to be like really, we used to be really chill with Logic, like Cap Slap, like all those like EDM artists and upcoming rap artists. Pretty we can talk to you pretty easily. Uh, just some of my favorite bands, you know, Weezer, The Wonder Years, Goodfellas, not a band. Pretty good. Which is Goodfellas your favorite movie? It is one of my favorite movies, yeah. So this one, Taxi Driver, Need I Say More, that's probably my favorite movie. You know, it really resonated with me at one age. I wake up to see that, I remember, you know, I gotta keep this body in <laughs> physical form, which I'm not doing. What kind of music do you listen to personally? Uh, personally, I listen to like indie rock and punk rock, really, like or like indie punk. But I listen to I listen to everything they blog to, but just not as much as they do. So much. Who is your favorite artist that you got to blog about? That I met or got to blog about? Both. Like, who has, have you met anyone really cool or like went into a show because of this blog? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, old best friend who's from Brooklyn is pretty, uh, pretty awesome indie artist. He's really, really talented, and we've got to like talk to him so much and hang out with him a lot. And that was pretty awesome. He's one of my favorite artists, so it's pretty cool. Sister Mary Catherine, don't lose yourself. If you've got time after finals, or plan to stick around during break, take advantage of the free community rides offered by SoulCycle this month. Book a bike online and experience a fun and intense full body workout. Welcome back to the GOAT Show. Uh, we are now playing LEGO Marvel Universe for the PS3. And uh, currently right now, I mean, we've been playing this for a little bit. Um, we're going to give you our first impressions on this game right now. Think, you know, basically, the premise of this is you get to run around and destroy everything, which is the premise of every LEGO game. And, um, you know, it's a lot of that. I mean, it's just a lot of breaking everything you can find in the world and finding all the, a lot of confusion, as you can see right now. That's the number one thing. Okay, we're going to get to critiques in about two seconds here. But yeah, basically. Forward air! That's dope! <laughs> no, she can shoot guns if you press uh, square. Or, oh, oh, look at his. God, look at that. Fanny on this. Oh, well, 
<laughs> Spider-Man has nothing to hide. There is a lot of tush action, as you can see. Like, there's never oh, been wow. like Look at that. that. Oh. Yeah. But, um... Yeah, Welcome the to Lego Marvel, the game where you stare at Spider-Man's ass more than Scarlett Johansson's. Boom! Boom! Everton. Quote of... <laughs> Alright, how do I get up to the No, 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 alright, keep going something. this way. Keep going. I think you have to um, get I gotta the do door. You gotta oh, something. Oh, shit! Somebody didn't do that earlier. Oh! Well, now, before Great. you know... I gotta, I gotta jump onto that? Yeah. yeah. Alright, folks. I'm probably going to screw this up. Yep. Yeah. Oh, oh, wait, wait. Now I see. I'm supposed to climb somehow up there. So as you, okay, so with the game <laughs> play right now, um, you can see there's a lot of confusion going on in this game, so we're already, this is supposed to be like a kid's game, and we're already like kind of lost <laughs> as a goes. trail. <laughs> Mason, Mason, I just voted to die off the island. This is yeah. gonna take a while. You are the weakest link! And then just push this. <laughs> wait, wait, what about, um, no. ah. wait, try, try, wait. try webbing that. I'm not kidding, like do the, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, oh wow. Now you got now bits I'm and pieces. Maybe. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, so we're, I think probably our biggest criticism of this game right now, we're still trying to figure out what the heck we're supposed to do to get these characters up. It's probably going to be something a little ridiculous, but it's cool with Spider-Man because you can, like, you can hang on to everything. Basically, there's, like, over a hundred different Marvel characters you can play as, and they all have different abilities. Yep. The only issue you with that is they thing. don't tell you what they are half the time, unless you're, like, a major comic fan, which could be an issue for some people. Or, you know, you just flat out got to experiment, and it gets kind of frustrating at times, because... Um, I know it's like APL Fisher and some of the other people over Machinima were having an issue playing this game, and it was hilarious. Um, it really can be a little glitchy at times, and it's just hard to get through most of the gameplay. So, shocker, we're actually going to have a review that's not that favorable for this game. Ooh, um, you just I'm gave it a seven and a half, though. Yeah, seven and a half. Okay, well, seven. I don't know what to do with my hands. It's a seven. Probably. All right, Spidey, can you like use your web on that shiny thing, I or is that a? Uh... I'd say as this game has progressed, it'd probably be a seven at this point. But uh, <laughs> it's getting lower. It's getting lower. It's getting lower. But um, yeah, so we're like currently stuck on this. It's gonna be five minutes of us stuck on the screen. And you know, the crazy. Okay, so basic premise of this: you break everything, or just recapping. You break everything. You can swap between over a hundred different characters. They all have different abilities. Wait, swap and moving take over. Yeah, okay, yeah. See what's going on. There you go. And uh, oh yeah, you can like play co-op with other people right now. You just use triangle to do different things. So we're all kind of lost. Hit that thing. Yeah, so the shiny thing underneath the floor. I think when you split screen, I can't do the thing. That's what I've been saying. That that there we go. Now I can do it. There we hey, go. Massive glitch here where I can't and do it. And there we go. Oh, block progression. Yo, I've been telling you all that, guys. I've been telling you all that. Silly. And silly. now you can see us progressing with the plot finally, where. And they expect eight-year-olds to play this game. Yes. Why do I, I still? Yo, I'm the smart one, guys. We all practically have college degrees in it. I'm smart. the eight-year-old here. I'm the eight-year-old here. I, Yo, I still have that thing on my hand. Oh, I whoa! Die. Don't die. He just died. Spider-Man just got lasered. Fuck me. Jeez. Fuck. The gear thing moves. What if you just ran straight through it? Oh no! You got to cloak through. Oh, he's doing it. it. Oh. You mean like I did? Oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Evan cloaked through it. We're all eight-year-olds here. Don't shoot that thing. Yo, it just glitched at this. Look at this. I saw the... Yeah. Yeah, it glitched. Testing is not a problem here. Only web-slinging characters can use their webs. Only web-slinging web characters can use their things to move things like this. Is there more than one Only web, the web characters? Uh, Bizarro Spider-Man. Venom? Oh, right, Venom. Venom is yeah, Venom. Bizarro Spider-Man. Is, is Venom playable? But you probably. I think so. Yeah, yeah, probably, yeah, yeah. yeah. Probably. I mean, if you can play as Captain Cold in DC. It's nice that they actually use voices in the Lego games now instead of just like purrs. Yeah, which is just like okay. <laughs> or shrugs. Shrugging is just a universal language. <laughs> oh, that's Stanley! Holy oh, shit, that was Stanley for just two seconds. Wow. Getting a visitor there. pass around here is grueling. I wish we could rewind that and just have that be. <laughs> Woohoo! Oh, yeah. You realize he had a pool for oh, me. Oh, I've seen this in Star Wars. I saw it in Family Guy. <laughs> There's Meg. There, there he is. Venom. Oh, Venom. It is Venom. Well, there we go. Wow. Okay. 
combustion engine was able to reconfigure into a ladder. Oh, Venom is... Whoa! Everybody, which means I'll just have to shoot them with the webs. The engine webs. Oh, you get shot. There you go. I think I'm Spider-Man. I can't fuck with that. Good thing I got a split screen like that. <laughs> Yeah, the split screen is a little bit of garbage. Look at that. I mean, I don't know how else they would deal with it. Hawkeye never misses. Maybe it's going through. Oh, great. Looks just like symbiote goo. Yeah, that's hot. Yeah. Oh, God. Switches don't look enough like switches in this fucking game. <laughs> As we're trying to figure out switches continuously throughout this game, uh, we'll probably be stuck here for a while because of the stupid split screen. Oh, God, it's just dragging nuts. Okay, because of a crazy split screen setup, uh, the lack of understanding half of the stuff that's going on within this game because we're trying to figure it out, and the numerous characters and stuff, it's actually pretty cool. I think it has pretty awesome. Uh, the gameplay can be fun, admittedly, sometimes, as well, when it's not frustrating most of the time. Um, but. Yeah, I mean, like, look at that. Look at that. Like, how am I supposed to play it? It's like, like jumping around right now. Oh my God. All I want is uh, is to just explore the city as I am. It's all I've ever wanted in my life, ever. All I've ever wanted. Which might be able to later. Later. The reference. You can later, and because of that, that's the only just reason. An open world where you can fly around as Iron Man and and make a few puns. That's fine. I like Spider. -Man. I'm a Spider-Man fan over Iron Man. I like, I like Spider-Man. Spider-Man's probably my favorite overall. Yeah. I love the comics. Iron Man's a close second for me. I wonder how Deadpool is going to be in this game. Oh, he's already showed up twice. In the first level, he shows up in like, the crowd waving at you. He shows up as like, no, well, like how they're, they're going to oh, right like, I'm oh, not sure, because yeah. he's, he's one of the more rated R characters. Yeah. characters. And we did just kind of ignore him as he fell a couple stories. And, Kind of Sorry, it'll be okay. He's good. Yeah, That's right. They'll probably turn it down or just have him be a cameo guy like Cammy. Probably cameo. But uh, yeah, okay. Well, I think you know since that basically covers the episode. Uh, my name's Evan. I'm Matt. And I'm Will. I'm Mason. And you're watching the, the Ghost, Ghost Show. Good night, everybody. Show. Good luck on your final. I'm so lost. I don't know. Where? Touch Lego. Very. All right, I'm out of here. I got work to Lego. Very, very horrible. Wow. This yeah, is, I'm gone. I feel, I feel so empty. I'm watching this. All I know is, Evan, give me a call when you figure out how to get Iron Man on this thing. Because until then, I'm not super stoked. You're watching Catalyst. Season 4, Episode 11. Stay tuned for more shows. Spending the holidays in LA? Make a visit to the Getty. It's been festively decorated. Sip on complimentary apple cider as you scope out stained glass windows and illuminated manuscripts in their new exhibit. Welcome back to the weekly show, Occidental. This is our last show of the semester, and unfortunately, it's also my last show of the year. So I've decided that in honor of the holiday season, we talk about a timeless holiday classic, the war on Christmas, as perpetuated by our beloved comrades at Fox News. Fox Nation has this incredible new interactive user-generated map where you can add your own stories of Christmas celebrations being oppressed by the government. Let's go to our first video. I don't call it a war on Christmas, I call it a war on fun. Uh, these people are, it used to be the right wing was always supposed to be the people that, that didn't like having fun. Now it's the left. They're going after charity concerts. They're going after Charlie Brown. Uh, they're going after nativity scenes, anything that involves families. So I wouldn't.
call it a war on Christmas so much as a war on fun stuff you do around Christmas. Uh, let's break that down a little bit. So the county says that this town has to take down their Christmas lights because they're hanging over the street. What could go wrong if you're hanging dozens of Christmas lights back and forth across the street? Well, how about obstructing emergency response vehicles? Every year there are about 230 house fires caused by Christmas trees. 50% of them occur between December 22nd and January 5th. Now, if you haven't had your head buried in the sand your entire life, you've probably seen an emergency response vehicle. These come in the forms of fire trucks and ambulances. They're very tall automobiles that take up a lot of room on the road. They might get caught on Christmas lights hanging across the middle of the street. Not only that, but there are reported 5,800 fall injuries related to hanging Christmas decorations. And if you're hanging Christmas decorations at a very tall height so that you can hang them across the street, you might fall and hurt yourself very, very badly. And then your Christmas lights will obstruct the ambulance from getting to you. Doesn't sound like the most intuitive thing to do. So our next instance is, takes us to the Gap. There's a Gap that is now including Merry Christmas in their holiday advertisements. And Fox Nation is toting this as a victory for... Christmas, because they're, they were losing at some point. Um, Gap responded by saying that it's not actually specifically related to Christmas. They're actually including a Happy Hanukkah and a Joyous Kwanzaa to all of their holiday greetings, because that's what we do in a very diverse country like the United States. We include everybody in the holiday celebrations. And of course, this brings us to our last, and it wouldn't be a Fox Nation Fox News article without bringing Obama into it somehow. So I got the quote from this article for you guys right here. Most of us mark the Christmas season by celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ. President Obama, on the other hand, will be marking the Christmas season by celebrating Obamacare. Right. Because Barack Obama, a half-white Christian, is definitely going to celebrate it by, to by touting his health care system that is a landmark in illuminating the problems with health care in this country. But is Christmas really about celebrating Jesus? Well, we can go to the ancient history of Christmas, starting with, uh, we'll start with the Norse and the Germans. In Scandinavia, They'd celebrate it through a Yuletide celebration, where they light a bunch of logs on fire and eat cows until the log burns out. Like, that's literally what they did. And the, the significance of it was that every spark on the log meant a new calf that would be born during the next season. It was essentially like Hanukkah for Vikings, and sounds very badass, if you ask me. Um, and then there was the... Then there are the Germans, who celebrated... It's pretty much doing the same thing, but for Odin, just like the Vikings. Um, and then the Romans celebrated Saturnalia in honor of their god Saturn. All of these things have the winter solstice in common, just like Christmas occurs at the same time as the winter solstice. The only reported instance in history of an actual oppressive act being done to Christmas was by Christians themselves, back when Oliver Cromwell was at the head of England. The uh, Puritans outlawed Christmas because of its pagan origins. In fact, in the United States, Christmas was not a federal holiday until 1870. So is there really a war on Christmas and on Christians being able to publicly celebrate their holiday? No. Because if you throw out the, the controversial nature of the Founding Fathers' religiosity, most of them were deists, at least conceded by the academic world, Every single president of the United States is Christian. They have holiday celebrations on almost every channel. ABC has 25 Days of Christmas. Uh, Tim Tebow started a massive faith-based phenomenon called Tebowing due to his public displays of religious affection. So, before you think that Christians could possibly be systematically oppressed in this country, Take a moment and realize how much of, of Christianity and Christmas is in the public view and how it's such a driving force to this country, especially Christmas sales. 
That'll do it for this semester. I've had a great time with you guys. We've had our ups, we've had our downs, and most of you haven't followed me on Twitter, which is kind of disappointing. Um, I definitely recommend it so you can keep track on all the shenanigans I'll be getting up to in DC. See you next year. <clears throat> Done. You don't usually have to worry about the camera falling off the tripod when you stop the clip, but I just did. That was solid. That was solid. If you love singing along to holiday tunes, you're going to love this. Sing holiday favorites with a lively crowd at the Music Center for the annual Holiday Sing Along. It's a free event, but entrance is on a first come basis. Hello, my name is Kenny Tran. On behalf of Oxypreneurship, I'll be showing you a tool named SWOT analysis. So SWOT is a tool that helps us analyze a business internally and externally. It can also be used for a product or new idea. So SWOT is an acronym for strength, weakness, opportunities, and threats. So we start off with internal. The first thing is strength. Strength is an advantage that the business has over the others, their competitors. So let's take Oxy as the example. The faculty to student ratio of Occidental College is our strength because we have much smaller class size compared to the others. Now let's move to Weakness. So weakness is something that your business or organization is weak at relatively to the others. And this is something that you want to improve in order to compete. So again, let's take Occidental College. One of our weakness is that we don't have a business major. And maybe this is why some video like this will help you in the future. Now let's move on to opportunities. Opportunity is a part of the external factor that affect your business or organization. So you have to use the, your strength to exploit this opportunity. Let's take Oxy as an example. The local businesses, the LA area and something like the Silicon Beach is our advantage, an opportunity for all Oxy students because we can take advantage of their internship programs. And then another part of this, uh, the external factors are threats. So threat is an external factor that cause troubles for your business or your idea or your organization. Using Oxy as an example, Let's say if Pomona moved their campus to Glendale, that would be a threat to the Oxy admission office in terms of recruiting potential high school students in the local area. So here you have it. SWOT analysis includes strength, weakness, opportunities, and threats. Once the firm complete the SWOT analysis, they will know what strength they have and how to take advantage of all of them. They would also know how to turn their weaknesses into strength for internal improvement. And then with those internal strength, they can take advantages of the opportunities that they have in order to gain the most profit or for social benefits. For threats, they need to be aware of it and stay away from it so that won't affect their business operations.
I'm Emma Gerch, and you're watching Freedom of Speech on Catalyst TV, where we ask Occidental College President Jonathan Veach your questions. We asked the student body to submit questions online, and we got a great response. So let's get started. What advice do you have for current college students? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think th the thing that I would urge them most is something I said to some of them when I, they did matriculation, and that is you really have these four years to do all, the, to investigate everything that you're interested in. And you, I think there's a temptation to be distracted by lots of things and not give yourself fully to what you're reading about. And I would just urge them to take full advantage of their classes, their books, their um, the opportunities that Occidental provides, and not necessarily get absorbed only in all the kind of outside activities. To what degree do you consider student input when making decisions, policy decisions, and um, what form does that input take? What structures are there? For well, I, uh, I try to meet early with ASOC to get a sense, and I meet regularly with the college, uh, with uh, the ASOC president to try to get his input uh, and to understand what the student agenda is as it's filtered through that. I think it's very important that student advocacy work through ASOC because that's the, those are the elected representatives of students. There are a number of students that serve on committees where important decisions are being made. So the, actually the Sexual Assault Advisory Board includes two students. Uh, and and uh, usually those are the vehicles by which I solicit uh, student input on major policy things. But every time I spend time with students, I ask them how they like the food in the, in the, in the dining hall. I, you know, we talk about alcohol policy. So I also kind of informally solicit input as well. What steps are you taking to engage alumni beyond donations? Well, we engage alumni all the time for all kinds of things. So, mm -hmm. um, but one of the ways in which, in particular, we're engaging alum, we, so we hold events all over the country. Uh, our faculty travel and talk, uh, give lectures uh, to alums. We uh, recruit alums as volunteers for the institution in various ways. But I think the way which I'm most hopeful is the development of our career center, which I'm hoping will be both um, extremely helpful to our students in, in, in helping them get ready for a job market, but also in bringing back alums who've been successful in various fields and, and, letting, and, and giving students an opportunity to see what their career trajectory has been, the serendipity, sometimes that route is very circuitous and serendipitous, and how they ended, started out as a lawyer and ended up in the film industry, or how they uh, started out as, uh, in the film industry and ended up as a teacher. Um, so. Uh, I think that's a way to really engage alumni around what has made their lives satisfying and successful and give students a model and perhaps even develop bonds of mentorship where that alum serves as a kind of someone who can help students get a leg up when they go out on the job market. It's indicative of the liberal arts, yeah. being a liberal arts yes. graduate, having yeah. that security. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think one of the challenges for students who get a liberal arts education is if you're an accountant, if you major in accounting, you know what your trajectory is. If you major in history, it's not clear what that is. And I think that at the end of the day, the ability to take a complex problem, break it down into its component parts, analyze those parts, negotiate positions with which you disagree, marshal evidence, and then assemble it in compelling written and oral form, those are the si skills of a successful person in any number of mm -hmm. uh, businesses and nonprofits. Uh, and I don't think students fully appreciate how well equipped they are to succeed, nor do I think that they're very proficient in translating the skills of a liberal arts education for a prospective employer. And I want to use our Career Center to give students a much more sophisticated understanding of how to be successful in the job market and translate what I th take to be, I think, are really considerable skills uh, and help an employer understand what they would bring to them. Do you know why the old wing of the library was donated by Bank of America and what our affiliation as an institution is with that corporation? So the old wing of the, the library was not donated by Bank of America, it was donated by the Clapp family. Uh, that's why it's called the Mary Norton Clapp 
library. Um, I think there may be a room in the in the old library that uh, for which we got some money from Bank of America. But if they looked at the plaque, that it's uh, that that gift was made in the 1960s. Uh, when uh, Bank of America was a much smaller entity than it is now, and certainly not embroiled in some of the controversies that it is now. So that's a very, very old gift, and really for a very modest portion of the library. Uh, how would you choose to handle a sudden disappearance of half of Occidental's operating funds? And how would you handle a sudden doubling in funds? Well, for sudden disappearance, I would panic and then slip my wrist. Uh, um, that would be a nightmare uh, because it puts at risk everything we're trying to do for students and it puts at risk our ability to pay our faculty and everyone else. And I can tell you that during the 2008-2009 crisis, Occidental not only weathered that, but we didn't have to let, uh, fire a single person or let go anybody. Uh, we just made that sacrifice and, and in fact as the state of California has pulled money out of, out of um, Cal Grants at uh, $1,000 per year per student, which is a significant amount of money, Occidental has replaced that. So um, our finances are in very good shape, but one always worries that uh, the stock market could take a dramatic plunge and we would be um, put at risk. Um, on the other hand, if one doubled it, I think I would uh, want to uh, make sure that we could hold the line of tuition and provide further financial support for students that are struggling to meet the demands of tuition. And then if there were any money left over, refurbish the buildings and the um, big lab equipment and the things that students use. All right. Uh, to finish up, a few more fun questions. Um, <laughs> who decided that the fountain shot was a good idea? Well, I, if you, by that question you mean it wasn't a good idea, I guess I will take <laughs> Not my words, yes, the students. I will take responsibility for that. Uh, they had me, um, I can't tell you how many pictures I've taken in front of a wall of books. <laughs> and I'm so bored by it. And I thought, well, what would be a kind of fun way to communicate a sense that the college is, a, is different and that there's um, a sense of fun here and play? And, and after all, I think... Really what education is about is about intellectual play. Um, and so I thought, well, what could I do that would be, would be a little bit surprising? And, uh, and so I suggested to the photographer that I stand in the fountain, and then what he said, after I stood in the fountain, he said, well, actually, you should lie down in the fountain. So <laughs> he called my bluff, and I, and, uh, and I uh, didn't want to be a poor sport, so I did that. And I can tell you, the first few pictures looked like I was drowning, not <laughs> like I was having fun. Just two more questions. This one just said, first car. Um, my, f <laughs> uh, my first car was, uh, a, I, uh, I was in love with old cars, and I um, managed to scrape together enough money to buy an old uh, 1967 convertible Cadillac, uh, which the guy who sold it to me swore up and down that it had been Judy Garland's car, only to find <laughs> that Judy Garland died three, two or three years before that Cadillac was even made. Um, and I'm sure he, that he got a few more hundred dollars out of it. Um, the car was so rusted uh, that, uh, that every time I would pull into a, a gas station, I would be, uh, uh, the, the gas attendant, then, then when they would pump your gas, would offer me a couple hundred dollars for it. Uh, I drove it across country and uh, I couldn't even put the top up. So I had a, and it was in midwinter, and it was, and so I put a sleeping bag across my, lap and, and then turn on the heater full blast and when it rained I would have to sit under the underpass until the rain <laughs> stopped. Um, but I, I loved that car and I uh, parted with it and it turns out that keeping an old car is more expensive than having a new car even though it looks like it should be less expensive. So I finally sold it. What is your favorite video game? Also what is your favorite movie? Um, well I, I don't play a lot of video games but I, do, I have a, a 16 year old son and for many years he played a lot of video games so I would play with him. So I I'm a very bad uh, golfer on Tiger Woods uh, golf. I played MLB baseball with him. Uh, and more recently he got um, uh, L.A. Noir, which is, uh, which is beautiful. And it's really kind of evokes Los Angeles in the 1930s in a way that's really quite amazing. And I've played that with him a few times. I've watched him play Grand Theft Auto, 
uh, and it turns out that there's something quite exhilarating in being chased by the police, um, but I've never played it. And your favorite? And uh, I love Moulin Rouge. I love The Town of Mr. Ripley. I don't know if you've seen any of those movies. Um, I think they're really great. Uh, I like most movies, really. It's hard. French Connection is one of my favorite movies. Brought to you by With special thanks to 